present today. My apologies, but please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Kay. We are very pleased today to present a, 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 this session of AsiaCrypt called uh, Physical Attacks, Leakage, and Countermeasures. Uh, we will have six wonderful papers in this session, and we will start with Secure and Efficient Software ma Masking on Superscalar Pipeline Processors. That will be presented by Barbara Giger. Barbara, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, you can see my presentation, right? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So yeah, welcome to my presentation. Um, so in the setting of physical side channel attacks, um, we have a certain cryptographic device and an attacker who wants to attack the device who has physical access to the device also and can mount therefore um, things like a power analysis attack. Masking is one countermeasure we can apply against these attacks where we split a sensitive value, for example, in our mask software into multiple random shares. The problem, however, here is that it relies on um, an assumption that independent computations result in independent leakage. And this is for, unfortunately not always fulfilled by microprocessors. There exist several solutions to it, but um, they all have in common that the software uh, has increased runtime and we also need uh, still uh, manual leakage assessments to make sure that the mask software is really secure on our microprocessor. Uh, in our work, we wanted to focus on mask software for more complex processes, so where you can barely do any manual measurements and assessments anymore. Um, we stick therefore to a former approach. Uh, in our case study, we focus on the 32-bit RISC-V SWERF core, uh, which is one of these complex processors. Uh, for example, it has nine pipeline stages and a dual issue pipeline. The main conclusions of our work are that first of all, there are several components in the SWERF core, which will cause problems related to masking. And if we want to fix these problems, we can do that on hardware or software level. However, um, hardware solutions often have uh, such a high latency that we cannot really um, implement them uh, to be practical. However, if we want to fix that on software level, we will still get a high overhead, but now we can apply special implementation techniques, uh, which will allow us to have efficient mask software on our Swerve core or on any other complex processors. Um, we used COCO as a formal tool, which will basically just verify that um, a mask assembly implementation runs secu securely on a given CPU netlist. And uh, in the case it's not secure, it will give us um, the exact cycle and gate in the netlist where the leak occurs. Um, the, this tool has already been applied to a much smaller processor, the EBEX core, and it was shown there that there are already several components in the EBEX core uh, which are problematic in the context of masking, for example, the register file. When we did the first analysis with COCO of the SWEF core, we found similar problems. So therefore, we carry over hardware fixes which were proposed for the small EBEX core to the bigger SWEF core. However, still, um, if we want to verify software implementations on the SWERF core, uh, these mask implementations will still lose several protection orders due to components in the CPU. One example are pipelines and execution units. So in this figure, you see the, um, the pipeline stages of the SWERF core. And uh, you see that here is a multiplexer which will forward data from the correct pipeline stage to the ALU. The problem here is that uh, the select, select signal of the multiplexer will glitch. And therefore also the forward data um, might glitch and combine um, all the inputs of the multiplexer. If we therefore um, have uh, shares of the same native value stored in our pipeline registers, forward data will potentially combine all these shares and we will have a leak. How can we fix that? Um, Hardware solutions are, as already mentioned, not feasible due to the huge latency overhead, which is why we want to fix that on software level by separating two instructions which load shares 
um, into these pipeline registers by multiple unrelated instructions, such as knobs. However, if we do that, we will still have a huge software overhead. Uh, but fortunately, there are several techniques how we can reduce this overhead. First of all, parallel implementations. So a serial implement implementation would mean on a really high level that we um, use knobs for unrelated instructions. While we can replace these knobs by something useful in parallel implementations by reordering the instructions of our mask software. Second, um, we found out that threshold implementations are uh, very useful in this context um, due to the non-completeness property of the component functions. And this can also uh, give us certain advantages when we want to design mask software for complex CPUs. However, if you want to have uh, more details on this um, topics, I would uh, yeah, invite you to watch my presentation on YouTube or read our paper. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Barbara, for your nice presentation. Uh, uh, we are going to, to ask uh, the audience to, uh, to ask questions using the chat in Zoom or the chat in Salad. Uh, we'll try our best to, to serve these questions. I have one question for you, Barbara. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you are using knob operations, um, mm -hmm. this doesn't open the door for fault attacks um, because you are using operations that are basically dummy, right? They do not. Um, yeah, exactly. So knob operations are simply a knob. So the CPU does uh, nothing, or I think in the case of Risk Five, the CPU adds um, the zero register with the zero register and so stores it in the zero register, so nothing happens. Right, right. And, and from your paper, uh, can we apply the technique for, say, for the S-box of Keshak? This technique? Um, yeah, of course. So we also have several experiments in our paper where we apply these uh, techniques um, the parallel implementations and the threshold implementations on the Ketchak S box. And we also have one TI implementation of ASCON. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think in the best case, we see that um, the overhead of inserting these unrelated instructions or um, yeah, as uh, following the software rules, which we propose in the paper is as low as 13%. Um, if you, for example, consider a TI implementation of uh, the Ketchak S box. I, I see. Thank you very much. We have a question here from Sajan Deep. He is asking us which masking schemes you have tested. Uh, which masking schemes we have tested? Um, yeah, so uh, of course, TI. Um, and also we have several DOM-based uh, implementations, so domain-oriented masking. Uh, we have applied that to the Ketchak S-Box, um, but uh, we have also some uh, multi mask multipliers, so end gates. Um, I think we also tested uh, the Trihina end gate there, um, and then I SW end gate, um, but you can find a list of that in our paper. Right, right. And, and which of these masking schemes you would recommend uh, for combining with uh, the techniques presented in this paper? Um, yeah, of course. So it depends uh, on what you want and also how your microprocessor looks like. So um, in our paper, we also have. Um, uh, like uh, several general rules for masking schemes on um, general microprocessors. So depending on, depending on how many execution units and pipeline stages your processor has. Um, but yeah, I mean, the good thing about threshold implementations is that um, if there are components in your CPU, which uh, might combine two shares, so 
only two shares, then you can use threshold implementations because there you will work with free shares for first order security. And then it's, um, so to say, it's, it's uh, not a problem if you combine two of them. So threshold implementations turned out to be uh, really useful in our, uh, yeah, in our scenario. Setting. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. We have time just for a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, SNI maskings? Did you try it? Uh, no, not really. So Coco, the tool we applied, um, is uh, yeah constructed to verify um, software in the time constraint probing model. This is um, a bit stricter version of the hardware probing model, um, but we didn't look at SNI and stuff. Okay, and right now the very last question by Bjorn Hasse. Uh, mm -hmm. He's asking us, uh, do you have any recommendation on how to proceed on CPUs where don't have the microarchitecture sources available? Yeah, this is a problem. So um, there you can, in my view, only stick to manual measurements. So you cannot apply the COCO tool, which we used because it requires that the netlist is kind of known to you and that you have the netlist. And if this is a closed source and you cannot access it, you cannot apply the tool. So uh, for closed source processes, you would stick to manual measurements. Okay, well, Barbara, you have more questions, but unfortunately we don't have more time, but we yeah. will have time at the end of the session. So you guys can ask, and maybe you can answer in solid, uh, Barbara. We will move on with the second uh, uh, paper of this session, Fault Injection Attacks Against NIST Post-Quantum Cryptography Round 3 CHEMS Candidates. Uh, this will be presented by Keita Shagawa. Keita, please proceed. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, let me start. So, this is the uh, uh, so I'm, I'm Keita Kusakawa, so this is a joint work with Akira Ito, Rei Ueno, Junko Takahashi, and Naofumi Honma. Okay, so let's start. So this is what we did in this paper. So we survey an uh, old camp scheme uh, in NIST PQC round three, and uh, we investigate, uh, we survey, so key recovery attack uh, against, the, uh, so using a plantation checking oracle and faulty decapitation oracle. And we also investigate attack surface in, uh, in the real world implementation, so PQM4, so which is a, a library for Cortex M4. And so multiplying them, so we uh, can uh, assess the effect of photo injection attack in PQM4. So let me start the uh, next page. Okay. So let us, we first review, so what is uh, CAM schemes in this slide? Okay. So, NIST starts post uh, standardization of post quantum cryptography uh, from uh, 2016, and this uh, succeeds. Uh, this reduces the number of candidates, and we are now in round three. So there are the four finalists for CHEM: Classic Materials, Kaiba, and Tru Seba, and five alternate candidates for CHEM: Bike, Frozen CHEM, SQC, and Tru Prime, and Psych. And so, in, and in the at, at the end of this year, or very beginning of the next year, so NIST will uh, decide the, the winner of, of CHEM scheme and signature scheme. But so here, so there are the nine candidates for CHEM scheme, CHEM scheme. Okay. So in next review, so what is the print checking oracle and the 40 day separation oracle? So we often consider so attacks against uh, attacks against the CHEM scheme with uh, use, uh, using oracles, so like a print checking oracle or 40 day session oracle. So print checking oracles are as us, uh, us to check H of X prime is H of X yes. So here, so X prime is a de uh, decryption result and X yes is also our yes. And if, uh, and so we consider often so the key recovery attack using such, such print checking oracle. And moreover, so if we can get H of X prime itself, uh, so, so, so here, so X prime is a, a decryption result. So uh, we can uh, more, we can get uh, more efficient key recovery attacks using such oracles. And so using those oracles, so uh, 
that the serial key recovery attacks using such oracles against uh, NIST candidates, NIST camp candidates. So, for example, so Kaiba has uh, such five papers for key recovery attack, and Saber has so four, uh, four papers like this one. And so, we additionally so propose a new attacks, a new key recovery attacks against the NTRU LP, LP, LP prime, so which is one of gem scheme uh, in NTRU prime. And moreover, so if we can use 40 day capitalization oracle, we can use the number of queries uh, because we can get h of x prime and instead of, of just we can check uh, h of x prime is equal to h of x yes. Also, this is a fact. Uh, and we next survey so attack surface in a PQM4. So for example, so enter prime has a CCA bug. So this is a, a, a this is a so what a bug Akira find, and uh, so here so this function is a uh, checks two cipher text and it will return zero and uh, if the, the the cipher text is not equal to and uh, then so it will return minus one. But unfortunately, so this uh, function always returns zero uh, due to the bug. Next one is also fraud game. So it is well known that so, uh, so in the last year, so Gu and Johansen and uh, Nilsson proposed a timing bug attack uh, against the key, uh, against the fraud game, but so it remains uh, in PQM4. The next one is the fault injection attack. So Seba, Kaiba, and Turuso shares uh, some structures, so which uses conditional move. Uh, so to replace uh, the critical information to a uh, random sheet. So here, so unfortunately, so this CMO function is called in uh, assembly, like uh, this uh, this block in the line eight in the right hand side. So if we skip this line, uh, this instruction uh, by some injecting effort, uh, then so it will uh, returns uh, H of X prime always. So therefore, so if uh, so we can uh, implement uh, efficient fault injection attack against such Saber, Kaiba, and Enteru. And the more of us, uh, and we did uh, experiment uh, in the real world PQM4 using the chip whisper. As a result, we obtained a such experiment result in this uh, in this slide. So this is the wrap up. So uh, we have been a uh, it's the PQC chem schemes, and uh, we have a key recovery attacks use, uh, using the pre static oracle and the 40 day expression oracle. And we also investigate attack surface in PQM4, and so we assess the uh, effect of photo injection attack in PQM4. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Keita, for your nice presentation and yeah, nice work. Um, so I have some questions. Could you say something more about countermeasures to this, to this attack? How uh, okay. Uh, countermeasures. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, for example, so uh, the most. Okay. So there are. I think we have we have two countermeasures. So the one is uh, so uh, default fault in, in uh, default fault implementation. So in the case of Saber, so unfortunately, so if we skip uh, this line eight. Then so uh, the X primes remain. So therefore, so if uh, set the random sheet as a default, then so we can uh, we can resist this fault injection attack. Also, the other, other major counter uh, countermeasures is uh, a duplicate instruction instruction. So we always uh, every instruction twice. Does it, does it make sense? That sounds sounds expensive though. But yeah, yes. yes, yes. Okay. And, and how do you compare this with your other work about side channel attacks, not fault attacks, but side channel attacks on? Ah, uh, yes, yes. So we also have been a uh, side channel attacks in in such uh, NIST PQC chems. And so this is, uh, fortunately, so this is accepted in uh, the next chess. Uh, my, my question was, how would you compare the two settings? Do you think that the two attacks are uh, complementary or one uh, is yes, stronger? Yes, two attacks are yeah, complementary, mm -hmm. but uh, so, ah, sorry, uh, so, so in the case of 40, uh, 
Yeah, so it, it depends on the uh, schemes, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me just quickly check if we have questions in Solid. No, no, no more questions right now. So thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation, Kita, and we will move to our next uh, presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we are doing fine on time. We will move now to our third paper in this session uh, that is a title, Divided We Stand, Uni United We Fall. Security analysis of some SAs, SCA plus SIFA countermeasures against SCA. Uh, so we will ask for the presenter to, to start the presentation, please. Uh, please slide and deep. Go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. We can we can hear you. Okay. So uh, I'm Shandeep Shah. I'm today I'm presenting our work, Divided with Stand, United with Fall, Security Analysis of some SCA CIFA countermeasures against SCA enhanced fault template attacks. This is a joint work with Orno Bag, Dilmanto Zap, Devdeep Mukhopadhyay, and Shivam Basin. Our team belongs to Indian Stop Technology Kharagpur and Nanyan Technical University, Singapore. So in this work, we are mainly proposing a combined attack technique, combined side channel and fault attack technique, where we have taken the recently proposed fault template attack in Europe 2020 and enhanced that with SC. Now it's a profile technique and uh, it bypasses some recently proposed CIFA countermeasures. Now why you have chosen this class of countermeasures? The reason is that it combines both side channel and fault attack countermeasures, the ideal target for a combined adversary. And our main aim was to see if these countermeasures really protect against an adversary when you have when both fault attacker and uh, side channel attacker are present together. We also expose few intricacies associated with masking while realizing CIFA countermeasure or any class of combined countermeasure. And we think that it's a really important information. We also enable middle round attacks without any ciphertext access or direct access to plaintiff. So how it works. So initially I assume that the adversary is in a profile setting where he has access to some device which is similar to the target device. And what he can do, he has a known key, randomness, everything. He can choose certain fault locations and excite them and measure side channel leakage. Now, based on that measurement, he creates a template where the template contains side channel measurements as well as intermediate values of the state. Now, Upon getting the actual device where the key is unknown, he excites those specific fault locations one at a time, measure side channel leakage, and access the template to get the secret. Now, it is fairly similar to the FTA model or standard side channel template model. And the difference is that with respect to FTA is that FTA uses a single bit of information. Is the ciphertext is correct or faulted? Here we have access to more information thanks to the side channel leakages, and we show that this information can be catastrophic for certain countermeasures. Now let's take an example here. Uh, we actually exploit the fault propagation to this logic and the presence of some detection or correction mechanisms to prevent fault attacks. So one example is like if I inject a fault here and assume that the box output has some error correction or detection logic implemented, we see that for Y0 output, the fault propagates mandatory every time there is a fault. However, for Y1 and Y2, the fault propagation is conditional and the condition depends on the input values or the input value of the SBOX. So effectively, we are exposing the SBOX input from just by seeing the fault differential at the output. Now, in practice, we cannot directly see these fault differentials because there are some countermeasures be present. So what we see, what we do here, we exploit the leakage from error detection or correction blocks, and we inject several faults in uh, each independent execution cycles and create a complete template like this here on side channel hemming weight values. And we can extract the intermediate state of the cipher and that eventually helps us to recover the key. Now, one might think that, okay, if I have masking implemented for this error detection or correction logic, it might not work, right? But surprisingly, it works. Why? Let's see. Let us consider a DOM gate, and I inject a fault at A0. Now, due to the fault propagation properties, B is leaked, as shown in this example. However, more interesting fact is that B leaks through only one output share of the implementation. The other output share remains uncorrupted. So that means with a single fault, 
and a fast product side channel attack i can break a fast product dom implementation and it actually extends to any order any other dom implementation so i can do a fast product attack on any other dom and it also extends to other i, I mean protected schemes like pini which has been recently proposed now let's see how it works for a cfa countermeasure so this specific one is due to teachers 2020 and it is constructed in a way so that whenever there is a fault in the computation, there is at least one mandatory fault propagation at the output as shown in line 16. Now we found that there are other fault propagations to the output which are conditional and they cannot hide from side channel leakage. As a result from this expressions from line number 15, we can actually perform a temp fault template attack. And here we actually use the first expression of line 15 only. So it's a fast order attack once again, and we can break this countermeasure. We practically tested this one with an Atmega board where the implementation is open source from the authors of the previous paper. It's a Kecha case box. And we actually targeted this with laser fault injection and power based side channel measurement, and we were successful to recover the secret base inside the implementation. So to conclude, combined attacks are really practical and should be considered for implementations having both fault attack and side channel attack countermeasure. I should mention that this attack is not limited to DOM implementations or ISW variants only. It also works on higher order TI and there are examples given in the paper. But also there is a summary of hope because we found that for certain TI implementation, uh, there are some way out where you can prevent this attack and non-completeness property of TI plays a very crucial role in that fact. However, whatever countermeasure has been designed so far after taking this attack into consideration are kind of heavyweight. So we have to look for more lightweight versions of the countermeasure. Also, we believe that this attack would work on certain other implementations because quite generic such as public implementations or authentication encryption scheme. Uh, surprisingly, we found that few multi-party web schemes like Kappa is fairly protected against this attack. So some more, I mean, in, information is required in that regard. So we'd like to do further research on that. So with this message, I would like to conclude. Any questions, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. So let's see if we have some questions for, from our audience. Meanwhile, I, I wanted to ask you, what is the the success rate of your attack that you presented so, in the last slide. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. So in this in, in this attack, I mean, we kind of uh, were able to recover most of the bits. Okay, so that's not a problem uh, because uh, the the implementation we used here it's an Atmega implementation. We found that uh, if you are injecting a fault some at lo some location, the location where you are measuring side channel leakage is several clock cycles away because it's a software implementation. So side channel signal was very good. I mean, uh, I mean we, we, there's very low noise so that you can easily extract the key. And another point is that we are recovering information bit by bit here. So, I mean, the templates were also quite good. But so this hardware implementation, it might be a little difficult. Right. So this attack is assuming that the, the attacker is quite powerful, right? Yes. Uh, he full can control. Do Mm -hmm. Yeah, not full control. He can do side channel and fault simultaneously. That's the only other option. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, well, thank you for your presentation, and we will have uh, time for more questions at the end of the session. We appreciate it. Thank you. So, we will move to the next uh, paper that we have. So we ask Francesco Berti to present efficient leakage resilient max without it ideal, idealized assumptions. No. So please, Francesco, go ahead. Do, do you see the slide, Itza? We can see it, but yeah, perfect. Okay, now it's full screen, perfect. Thank you for uh, this nice presentation. I would present uh, this work, which talks about providing integrity in presence of leakage with only assumption in the standard model. As usual, we when we talk about integrity, we have Alice who wants to send a message to Bob in a secure way because she wants that Bob is sure if the message he has received comes from Alice or not. So she uses a Mac, which computes a tag for the message and then Bob verifies this mess this couple message tag. But we have our adversary, Heave, who can see this couple message tag 
And also, she, is, she has physical access to this cryptographic device. She can measure, uh, she can measure uh, physical quantities uh, which are obtained during this computation. Which these physical quantities may leak critical information, in some cases, even the full key. Eve wants to be able to send a message to Bob in, personif in personificating Alice. The goal in our talk is to provide some Mac which are integer, which provide authenticity in process of leakage. I start talking about some side channel about uh, and uh, how side channel may affect integrity. For example, we can consider this simple uh, Mac, which where we have a message which is hashed to obtain a value H, which is the input of a block cipher, and we obtain a tag. In verification, what we can do, we recompute the, the real tag to tilde, and then we check if uh, to is uh, uh, to tilde is the tag provided uh, with the message. We can see that clearly, if we can recover with side channel the key, we can forge. But also, for example, if we can recover with side channel um, tilde to, we can forge. Thus, we this shows that it is important to understand. Uh, to understand that there are much more information to protect in presence of a standard than only the single key. And moreover, we must consider that cryptographic devices should not be seen as black box oracles. And then we have the problem of defining security of uh, the block cipher or the tweak of block cipher in presence of leakage. There is a, an assumption which is ideal, which is leak free which says that uh, the leakage gives no information about the secret of the block cipher, but it is problematic because it's not verifiable. Thus, in um, this talk and in the paper, we use a strong unpredictability with leakage, which means that for the adversary, it's difficult to predict a new output for a fresh query of the block cipher, or applicable block cipher, even if uh, she has access to the leakage of uh, uh, f and of f minus one. Here now I will present the results of our paper, which are three max, which are strong and pretty, which are um, which provides integrity in presence of leakage. The first use a one clickable block cipher call and a collision resistant hash, and it is beyond barely secure if the tweak is uh, longer than the block size of, of the typical um, block cipher. Then we have a second typical block cipher which use two TBC calls and the collision resistant hash, and we can provide beyond build the security, even uh, adding a, st a, standard, uh, a standard model hypothesis on uh, an additional standard model hypothesis for the hash function. Then the third, which is, which, use, which is the more efficient, which use one TBC call and the collision resistant hash, it is, we can provide security with strong assumption on the hash function. In for all these um, in the security in the security analysis of all these construction, we assume that the trick of block cipher to be strong and predictable with the cage. I will show one of these construction. The first one of the program that we we discovered studying this is that there may be some problematic interaction between the hash function and the trick of block cipher when there is leakage. So what we do is to use to provide, to present this. Uh, this Mac, where we have the message, which is hashed to obtain a value H, which is used only as a tweak of the tweak-out block cipher. Then we use a fixed input for the tweak-out block cipher, and we obtain the tag from this fixed input, which in this case is 0n, and this tweak. The idea is to use the message, and so the hash of the message, only as a tweak, and to use a fixed input for the tweak-out block cipher. And in verification, we would like to use the inverse of the tweakable block cipher. So what we do is, again, we take uh, to verify. What we do is, again, we compute the hash of the message. And we inverse the tweakable block cipher. And we obtain a value, x tilde. which And then we check if this value is equal to 0n, which is the fixed input for the TBC, or not. The idea is that this, if this x tilde is leaked, no problem, because if it is 0n, you have already forged. If it is not 0n, you cannot use for a new forgery. And so using this idea, we can prove that this construction is secure only with uh, assumption that can be verified by everyone. I thank you for your attention, and I'm open for, uh, for any question.
Yeah, I have a question about uh, the capital F function. Is that the same thing to the MAC function we use normally? What the F is a trigger block cipher. Is it to cover block cipher? So this allows that uh, you insert uh, the m bit of zero as an input. Yeah. We use a constant input for the to cover block cipher. And what changes during uh, Mac authentication are the tweak. Essentially, uh, you can choose uh, any string, uh, any constant string as an input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as that you do the inverse. Uh, they, yes. they equal. Yeah, the important stuff is that you use only the same uh, constant string as input for all Mac queries. What is the constant input is not important. Because okay. if you change also the constant input for all this, you may have X tilde, which is equal on one of these constant inputs. And this may be problematic. Uh, yes, thank you. Francesco, I have another question. Uh, you are assuming that the two-cover block cipher can is unpredictable for the leakage, right? This yes. is one. Uh, how realistic is this, in your opinion, to assume this? Well, in my opinion, first, if it's not unpredictable with leakage, we cannot have any security using two-cover block cipher. So at least uh this is the minimum requirement if you can predict new output uh if the cage there is no point to use something it may be really problematic second i think that substantially stronger predictability it is much or less the same as retrieving the key because i do not see as why for a good block cipher you can predict the output not knowing the key for new in, for a new couple input for new input and uh, tweak. I do not see how you you can do a prediction for a good trigger cipher without knowing the key. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you very much. So I don't know if there are more questions. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. Please go ahead. No, 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 sorry, I was stopping oh. sharing. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can see it now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Francesco, thank you very much for your presentation, your nice presentation, and we will move now to our next speaker. Um, so we will ask Xian Meng Sim to present default a uh, cipher level resistance against differential fault, fault attack. Uh, please, Xian, uh, go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Unfortunately, uh, Sia Ming couldn't be here today, so I will be presenting instead. Mustafa, yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No. Mustafa. Uh, so uh, this is a joint work with Anupak Bakshi, Chief Ambassador, Jack Prayer, myself, Toma Biren, and Sumanta Sarkar, and Sia Ming. And uh, the team is from uh, NTU, uh, Austria, and DSO Labs. And uh, in this talk, I will just give a brief uh, discussion of the paper. So I will give an introduction to DFA attacks and the DFA resistant framework we propose and then the actual instantiation that we propose in the paper. So fault attacks are a form of uh, invasive side channel attack. So you have the cipher and you actively inject a fault inside and then based on the values of the output, the cipher text, you can predict some information about the key or the plain text. And usually to protect it, we need physical protection on the engineering level. So we need uh, some form of shield inside the integrated circuit or something like duplication, fault detection. So we encrypt twice and then we detect whether the cipher text is different or not. However, such uh, countermeasures can still be bypassed by injecting stronger faults or by injecting the same fault twice in both executions in case of duplication. So 
what we were looking for is uh, fault resilience. So we were looking for a cipher level solution that can be applied on top of existing block ciphers and can provide a lower bound on the search complexity of DFA in terms of the key recovery. So we propose the DFA resistant framework. And in the first part of the paper, we look first at the main problem where DFA comes from, which is the S-box. So the S-box is an n-bit lookup table. And usually in DFA, we will inject a fault at the input of the S-box and we will observe the output difference. And from this equation, we can find uh, some solutions for X and then by repeating the equation two or four times, we can solve and find X uniquely. And this is used to recover the key with very small number of folds. And that's because when we design good S boxes, usually they have a very low differential property. And what happens is this low probability means that we can solve with very small number of differences if we have access to one S box, which is the case in DFA. So for a normal cipher, this doesn't matter because we have many rounds, but for when we're considering DFA and we're accessing say one round, this becomes a problem. So as I said, the good properties of the S box make DFA easier. So we inject the fault and we observe the output difference. And usually this leads to a very small number of solutions for K. And we repeat a few times and we can uniquely identify K by reducing the key space every time. So we observe that if the S box has what we call linear structure. So for example, it has one input difference that always goes to the same output difference. Then the situation is slightly changed. Of course, any S box will have the input difference zero always go to output difference zero, but we want non-trivial linear structures. So we want S boxes that have other non-zero differences that have this property. And what we observe is that if we have this property, then we can never uniquely identify the Z in this case, or the key if we have a key X or to the output of the S box. So even if we uh, apply many faults, we can never uniquely identify the key. We can only reduce the key space to a size that depends on how many of these linear structures exist in the S box. So based on this, we think this is good for DFA because we, since we can bound the number of key candidates that we can get out of this, then it might be helpful for DFA protection. So for example, here, we look at uh, some cases. So if we have a four bit S box and we have a 128 bit state or block size, then we will need 32 S boxes. And if we have one linear structure, which is the trivial case, only linear structure at zero, difference zero, then we can uniquely solve the S box and we can uniquely find the round key. Well, if we have two linear structures, so there is one more difference that has this property, then we can at most reduce the solution space to two values. And if we have 32 S boxes, this would lead to a key space of two to the power 32. If we have four linear structures, then uh, the number of solutions is four and the number of overall key space is two to the power 64, which is around birthday bound. If we have eight bit S box, the, these numbers become better, but the problem is it's harder to come up with this S box with more linear structures when it's 8-bit because the search space is much bigger. So based on this in mind, we propose the DFA resistant framework, which we say that if we have a cipher E, we assume that we have a construction that's secure against DFA and we apply it before and after the encryption. 
So if we're doing encryption, usually DFA will be applied towards the end of the encryption. And since the rounds at the end are part of this construction, they should be secure against DFA. And if we're doing decryption, then it will be the opposite and the layer at the beginning will have this problem. Based on these two ideas, we propose the default, which is an instantiation of the DFA resistant framework. And basically we have a default core, which is a normal 128 bit block cipher. It's based on the gift permutation. And we have default layer, which is used to implement the outer layers. And the difference is for the default layer, we use this as boxes with linear structures. And if we, you don't use, want to use default core, the idea was to, that you can use default layer for any cipher, it doesn't have to be default core. And the goal is to have 64-bit security against DFE. Unfortunately, the combination of the SBOX idea with the DFA resistant framework led to more, uh, recent crypt analysis and new attacks emerge, which show that the SBOX when used inside an SPN will, so it's true that we will never be able to uniquely identify the key, but we will be able to get a equivalent key that can be used to instead of the actual key. While it requires more faults than a normal SPN, it still does not provide the intended DFA security. So now the current research question is, can we use these default S boxes in a different construction that's not SPN to provide the intended security only? Thanks for listening, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Mustafa, for your presentation. Um, uh, I have a question related to sure. the, the practicability, the feasibility, feasibility of your attack, because you are assuming that the the attacker can 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 launch several faults. For instance, in this in this slide, right? How how this one? Yes, how practical is that an attacker? This should be a very powerful attacker, right? That can inject not one but two faults in a very timely manner. No, uh, the two faults here are not meant to be in the same execution. So you will fix the plain text, yeah, and then encrypt it many times, and each time you will inject a different fault. Mm -hmm. but so, have have you made experiments on this? Uh, normally, this is the same fault model that's used to attack AES. Of course, when the number of faults increases, it becomes harder. But uh, DFA against AES works in exactly the same way. You inject, you encrypt the same plain text twice or three times, one without fault, and then two times you inject different faults. In this work, you didn't try this experiment. No, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is there are more questions uh, for Mustafa. Uh, so about the crypto analysis of the schema, sure. you mentioned that there is some an, an, a successful attack. So yeah. I don't quite understand the implication of this attack. That does it mean that the default cipher is not secure? So, yeah. So it means that uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't provide sixty four bit security because while the attack requires, I think, even if you have like uh, independent round keys for the default layer, it will require, I think, around 2000 faults, but it would still not fi uniquely find the key, but will find some equivalent key that you don't need the actual key anymore. So yeah, I mean, in the current construction, it does not provide the internet security. It must, uh, I think still provides uh to some extent the security. For example, uh, the security goal is 64 bit, right? So after the attack is launched, so how many bits of security have, or roughly speaking? Uh... So after this number of faults, it be, because the thing is, you don't care about the actual key anymore, the equivalent key is enough. So after X number of faults, you will not, uh, like there will be no security. Maybe the number of faults is larger than a normal cipher, but it's still doable. I mean, in theory, at least. 
Yeah, thank you. I think it's kind of a, a serious uh, attack for the yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions for Mustafa, thank you very much for your presentation, Mustafa. And we will move to our last uh, paper for this session that will be presented by Abdul Rahman Taleb. And uh, yeah, so please, Abdul, uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Hi, can you see my slides? Yes, we can, uh, but not in full. Yeah, now we, we can do it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So hi, everybody. I'm going to present uh, our work joined with uh, Sonia Belaid, Mathieu Rivin, and uh, Damien Varnio. So in this work, we reason about the security of uh, implementations against side channel attacks. And so the most deployed countermeasure against them is the masking scheme. And so the idea is to split a sensitive variable into n values that we call shares, and their recombination should give back the original secret. And so we're, when working with mask variables, uh, regular operations of add, multiplication, and copy over the field are replaced by functionally equivalent and share circuits that we call gadgets. In addition to a new gadget that we call refresh, which aim is to produce a fresh and share copy of the original variable. And so below you can see an example of such an addition gadget with two shares, for example. So to reason about the security of masking schemes in theory, uh, the community introduced the idea of leakage models. And in, the, in this work, we particularly focus on the random probing model, where each variable is considered to leak its value with a fixed probability p. Now we focus on this model because it offers a very interesting trade-off between closeness to the reality of leakage and convenience for security proofs. So in our work, we focus on uh, the strategy introduced in the random probing model, which is called the expansion strategy. And it actually allows gadgets to be composed and expanded to achieve arbitrarily large security levels. Now in our work, we define the dynamic version of the expansion strategy. The idea is to use a different expanding compiler, which is formed of a set of gadgets at each iteration to produce a new circuit where each gate is replaced uh, of the original circuit is replaced by the corresponding gadget and each wire by n wires carrying a sharing of the original wire. Now doing so, we hope to replace the leakage rate P of the original circuit by a smaller failure event probability in the compiled circuit. And this strategy can be applied recursively with a different compiler at each step to achieve a desired security level. Now at the end, the failure function is a composition of different functions for different compilers, while in the original expansion, uh, the failure function in the static version, the failure function is just unique and is composed with itself a certain number of times. Now to show the benefit of using dynamic expansion instead of a static expansion with a single compiler, I will show you here a figure representing the complexity in terms of number of gates of, an, of a random probing secure version of the AES algorithm and its security after applying the expansion strategy. Now for this, we use the three share and five share compilers proposed in Eurocrypt 2021, which are the best compilers proposed uh, in the state of the art until now. Now let's say for instance, that we would like to achieve 80 bits of security then we can achieve it either by doing 11 iterations of this three share compiler, but also by starting with seven iterations of the three share and then two iterations of the five share compiler. And we have a factor 10 improvement over the complexity. If for example, we would like to achieve 128 bits of security, then we can still use 11 iterations, uh, iterations of the three share compiler, but we could also use uh, seven iterations of the three share compiler and then three iterations of the five shares uh, compiler. And we almost have the same complexity, but we also almost double the achieved security level. Now we can actually observe that doing the dynamic approach, we always win either in terms of complexity or achieve security, and even sometimes in both, uh, on both parameters. Now, after exhibiting the dynamic approach, we could have two possible directions for improvements. We can either look for gadgets with a small number of shares, which, which can tolerate the best, the best leakage rate possible to start the compilation with, and then look for gadgets with the best expansion parameters for a generic number of shares and with good asymptotic complexity to continue on the expansion. Now in this work, we are able to provide an asymptotic construction of gadgets with quasi-linear uh, complexity, while the best construction, which is from Eurocrypt 2021, achieves um, values for the exponent e in the, uh, in the complexity, which are close to three for a reasonable number of shares, our new compiler quickly achieves a, a subquadratic complexity in the same settings. 
So to summarize our contributions, we provide a full construction for a new RPE compiler with quasi-linear asymptotic complexity, and which improves on the best RPE compiler known, uh, known to date. And we also introduce the concept of dynamic expansion, which proves to be more interesting than its static version. And we actually can start the expansion with an RPE compiler, as I said earlier, with a small number of shares, tolerating the best leakage rate and then continue on with other RPE compilers, which don't necessarily tolerate a good rate, but have a much better asymptotic complexity to have an overall good asymptotic complexity. Now, since the question to the second part of the dynamic expansion have been partially answered in this work, one of the natural future works or follow-up works would be to find gadgets with small number of shares, for example, three share constructions, which can tolerate the best leakage rate possible. So that's all I have to say about our work. And if you are interested, I encourage you to go read our paper or see the full presentation. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdel, for your nice presentation. We have a, a question by Sayandeep. Uh, he's asking if you have anything about SNI uh, link. Uh, Sorry, if we have... Uh, my, my question is, uh, how large is the final circuit after compilation? What is the final size? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, so the size of the final circuit depends on the gadgets that we use in the beginning. And so the, the better the security parameters of the gadgets are, the, the smaller the, the circuit will be. So for example, what I showed earlier on the AES, you can see that in terms of number of gates, it's huge. So it's actually... It's some kind of a proof of concept, but it's also an, an improvement over previous work. So the first work of the expansion was very like theoretical proof of concept. And we're improving on like the size of the circuit that we obtain after the compilation. And so we can use, for example, some SNI gadgets that are maybe secure in the probing model, which is sometimes they are also secure for our constructions, not always. And uh, we might obtain like good circuit sizes, but yeah, it still depends on the gadgets. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, then I have a question in this slide, now that you're here. Uh, do you have any proof of, uh, not proof, but maybe some uh, ideas of optimality or that these are the best possible solutions, the ones that you're presenting? Uh, no, these, these are not necessarily the best possible solutions, but in the state of the art until now, the two compilers are the best ones yet. But for example, in our new work, we provide another compiler which has much better uh, complexity so it will reduce uh, over like the 10 to the power 16 for example it will reduce it further and also if we can find uh, gadgets which can tolerate a better leakage rate of this one 2 to the minus 7.6 we can also reduce further the complexity so we we don't necessarily have yet a minimality uh, argument but we we know intuitively that this is not minimal yet there is still mm -hmm. much room and probably uh, finding out these optimality results would be a hard problem, right? It's not, yeah, 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 it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And now, for example, we're looking at the second OPIC question, how to find gadgets with best tolerated leakage rate. And we actually observe at some points that it's not evident how to find them and even know like if they are the best ones, how to know they are the best ones. There are many parameters that can like uh, modify the, the, the um, the optimality argument. So at some point we have to fix some hypotheses in order to continue on the argumentation and see like, uh, it will also, it will always depend on some kind of fixed parameters. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, some more questions for Abdel? If not, then thank you very much for your presentation Abdel. Uh, that's really nice. And with this, we end our session of physical attacks and countermeasures. So thank you very much for being here. And we hope that you still uh, keep enjoying more of uh, the Asia Crypt main program. Thank you very much. <laughs>